Jonah. If you've got Bibles with you, open up to Jonah. We also have it there on the screen. That screen. Oh, there we go. We're looking at the first three verses of the book of Jonah. Luca gave us a little spoiler alert earlier, but I'll let that one pass. I thought he was going to start preaching, but we didn't get to hear him preach. So, we're looking at Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through to 3. We'll have a little bit of a chat about it beforehand. We're starting this series, which, by the way, is going to be a fairly short series. Um, Jonah is a very short book, only four chapters, and I think there's a little less than 50 verses altogether. So, it'll be fairly short in the lead up to Christmas. But we will touch on most of the main points, if not talk about most of them in Bible study as well. And in this series, we're going to cover some aspects of sinfulness and sovereignty. Although that's sort of going to be our theme running throughout this series. Sinfulness, in that we have fallen short of the glory of God and we have sort of turned to our own ways and live according to that reality because of our nature, because of our falling short of the glory of God and, and uh, uh, lacking conformity to his law. And we're also going to look at sovereignty, which is a lot of what we were talking about there in the LBC as well. The fact that God is so transcendent, so above, so masterful in all of his ways, so maximal in all of his ways, that he, as, as Sproul says in, in, in his theology, uh, in his, um, in his uh, uh, lectures and in his sermons, cons consequently throughout his, his life, that no molecule is rogue when it comes to God. He doesn't let any molecule outside of the reach of his own wonderful, ordained sovereignty. And so we can trust in that while thinking about our sin. And we're going to see a lot of those themes come through as we look at the story of Jonah. Quite literally a sinful man, however, used by God, again, sovereignly, in order to accomplish his will and accomplish his own purposes. It's sort of that age-old illust old illustration of God drawing a straight line with a crooked stick. Right? He uses this sort of broken instrument, which we'll see how broken he is, and he, and he accomplishes his purposes in and through that regardless. God, in his masterful sovereignty, has so ordained his creation that in and through crooked and sinful people, he would bring his will to pass, whatever that will may be. Whether it's using Paul, right? the Tarsian uh, 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 Pharisee, the one who was set to, to persecute the church, who was killing Christians, who was on a road to Damascus for an intentional mission to go and persecute Christians, chuck them in jail, or to the very extreme, even kill them. And so God intervened. He's, he's turned from Christian persecutor, persecutor of the church, that which who would do evil against God's church, to one who would bring growth to God's church, who would be a church planter, who would preach the gospel to a multitude, regardless of how much persecution he would undergo. So a crooked instrument was used for God's glory. Whether God uses Peter, right? Peter, in all of the, the foolishness that he embodied throughout Jesus' ministry. The guy who denied Jesus three times out of a fear of the Jews. The guy who literally Jesus nicknamed Satan because he was uh, beating against and rebuking Jesus for prophesying that he was going to die on the cross. This Peter, who was consequently used, even in some of the first examples of great, great revivals and great salvations in the Bible, to preach to a Jerusalem crowd and saved over 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost. Right? And then we get to Jonah. Then we get to Jonah. The fool who thought it wise to disobey God, to flee from God, who was then sovereignly used by God, as an instrument to stir revival in a pagan nation which was quite literally, of the day, the ugliest of pagan nations. This is the sort of angle we're going to be taking on this series. We've entitled it, Sovereignty Amidst Crookedness. You'll notice, with that title and what I've said so far, that we're not just doing a cool Sunday school fish story. Right? Like that seems to be, uh, for the most part, across the landscapes of different sermons you can find on Jonah, that's kind of the thing. Right? You talk about the fish, and the whole thing is about the fish, and it's a cool story of how God saved a guy from a fish, and that becomes sort of the, the sole or primary theme, but I don't believe that that's necessarily the case. It needs to be said that whenever you approach a text, 
This is kind of a hermeneutical principle. This is how you interpret data, right? When you interpret, uh, when you come to a text or you come to the Bible in general, you should do this when you preach, you should do this when you read a new book of the Bible, when you're doing your, your Bible readings, you should always be doing this or at least having it in the back of your mind that you want to be understanding what the main point is of the thing you're reading. And I just believe that as we open up the book of Jonah, the most important thing, the most amount of meat, right, the most amount of benefit that we can gather from it is to talk about this awesome harmony between the sovereignty of God and the sinfulness of this man, which we, I would argue, can relate to in a lot of different ways. I don't think it's necessarily just a cool, miraculous story of a dude who survived being in a fish, but rather it's one of rebellion, depravity, stubbornness, and then consequently, redemption, sovereignty, providence, salvation, mercy, right, revival. The former being on the account of Jonah, and the latter, latter being on the account of the sovereign God who loves his people. And in many ways, it's almost sort of an Old Testament sort of application of a lot of the different stuff we looked at in previous weeks in the kingdom study, right? Learning about missions and learning about God's kingdom and learning about his process, uh, 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 learning about his, uh, uh, the different uh, ideas and the different ways he has to save people and the instruments that he uses in that being the church and that being us. It's almost an Old Testament application of that idea. It's seeking the sovereignty of God throughout the entire ordeal of a stubborn man keen to reject God and reject his commands. Let's read the first three verses. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, and so he paid the fare and went down into it, to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Let's pray. God, as we read your word and we seek to understand more from it, would you enliven and enlighten to our minds the meat of it so that we can apply it to our lives and live in step with it. Would you bless us, Lord, as we're here today to do this, and we ultimately, Lord, you be glorified in and through this story. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today, we'll sort of do a, a quick overview and use our time wisely to really understand where we're at in the story of Jonah. We'll get, up, we'll get ourselves, meantime, uh, up to speed on what is, I believe, the main point of this text. So as we said, it's a story of God using a crooked instrument such as Jonah in order to culminate his purposes to save people. And according to chapter 4, it happened, right? 120,000 Ninevites repent and turn to Yahweh. And so, as we survey, I want to make something abundantly clear before we start poking fun at Jonah, before we start making fun of Jonah, and we start uh, uh, sort of uh, singling him out in, in this sort of uh, maybe uh, 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 evil way. And before we start doing any of that, we should understand that we find ourselves a lot in the example of Jonah, right? We need to see it that way. As much as Jonah acted a fool, we must read Jonah with a good understanding of where we find ourselves in the context of being formerly unsaved and now saved and also now saved at certain times acting as fools because it does happen right we're called to mission we're, we're, we're saved by God we're changed and renewed by the gospel and yet from time to time if we are humble enough and if we can search our hearts enough we act as fools we are not perfect, right? As the theologians would say, we are not yet free of the overwhelming presence of sin. We only reach that in glory, right? And so we are not perfect instruments of God, but we ourselves are also crooked in that we are not sinless. Which is to say, in many ways, we are like Jonah. Whether we are, uh, uh, to add to that, we are now actually new covenant believers in light of Jonah. And so as we actually think about it, and we think about relating ourselves to the example of Jonah, we should think about it this way. As New Covenant believers, with a greater uh, uh, indwelling of the Spirit, with a greater revelation of God's truth and in through the New Testament, with uh, a, a fuller power in understanding all of the revelation to do with the Messiah in and through the Word of God and what He has done, and even through all of that, and as we relate it to the text, we still act as fools. 
right? We sort of should be humbled by that reality. This is the universality of sin. Universality of sin. Universality of crookedness and foolishness. Stemming, of course, from the fall, right? From the Garden of Eden. The fact that we have fallen from grace. Where we were once upright, we chose our own way. And as a result of that, every human being born thereafter is thus tainted by original sin. And they live like it. Right? We are all uh, victims of that reality. And we do it willingly, right? This is where we find ourselves. Because of the fall, we have been so plagued from the curse, whereby we act in defiance to the God of heaven on the basis of our corrupted nature. We live out what's true about us. Isaiah calls it our turning away each to his own way. And the cure, of course, the fix-all, right? The overwhelming cure for that problem is also found in Isaiah. The suffering servant, right? The one who is going to take away our sin. The cure to that problem of the fall, the cure to the issue that mankind finds itself in, is no other world religion, it's no other striving to impress God, it's no other uh, world leader or guru that can tell you otherwise, but rather it is the suffering servant found in the very same chapter of Isaiah, and it's the one who underwent the torment and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, the being torn apart, and it's the fact that by his stripes we are healed according to Isaiah. And we have the blessed assurance of all that Christ has done. Considering this, we still under, uh, undergo living under the presence of sin. Jesus tells us to, ki tell us to kill it as we live. Right? We are to be dead to Christ. Uh, sorry, dead to sin. Oops. Dead to sin and alive to Christ. And we are to kill it that, uh, that it does not kill us. But yet we struggle. We struggle. When we relate it to Jonah's context, we are also given commands by God to go and make disciples, just as he told to Jonah. We are told to go and make disciples, and even then, at times, we are foolish. Even then, at times, New Covenant and New Testament believers flee to Tarshish. We go away from the presence of the Lord and seek to avoid that imperative. Right, there is a deep-rooted temptation in all of us which remains frustrated with our neighbor, frustrated with him, rather than being one who would preach the gospel to him. And there are multiple different reasons why that may be the case. A lot of us can think this when it comes to mission. Right? God is compassionate. God wants us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. God wants Jonah to go to Nineveh. Right? And there's all of these imperatives and commands in Scripture, and yet sometimes we flee, and we come up with this barrier of excuses to ignore our calling, and we do so in light of not really understanding the compassion of the Lord of heaven, and not having a compassion that uh, lives up to his compassion. Right? Having a compassion that is a little below that, but yet again, we fail to love our neighbor. We don't seek for their conversion, but we actually don't love them. And a lot of us can think that way when it comes to mission. Right? Why go to Byron? Right, that's an example. Why go to Byron? Right? There are a bunch of weirdos down there, right? A bunch of hippies. Leave them alone. Why go there? It's not, it's not really my thing. Right? And we, we can sometimes come up with all of these different ways of thinking about it. And even to re uh, uh, recount a story of a conversation that I had at Byron, there's always a temptation for this. At the end there, before we were about to leave, I was surrounded by four Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Four of them around me, and there was a, a very solid sort of 15, 20 minute discussion that I was having with them. Back and forth, back and forth, reasoning with them the gospel, reasoning with them the scriptures, pointing out the fallacies of their worldview, understanding, uh, uh, trying to get them to understand the God of scripture. Right? I was trying to reason with them. Jesus cannot be a created being. If he's a created being, we have no salvation. Right? I quoted Romans 3. God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ, all on the basis of the fact that he underwent uh, the propitiation for our sins. A good dude, or just a guy, or Michael the Archangel, can't do that for billions of people. Right? So I pointed out that we're having this discussion, having this conversation, open up to Colossians chapter 1, Jesus created all things, and he tried to correct me all other things. Now, that's a Watchtower translation. All things! He created all things, and he can't have created himself, and by his word, all things are sustained according to the word of his power, according to Hebrews chapter 1. And we're going back and forth, and it's an awesome discussion. I pointed them to all of these texts, 
And by the end of it, there was almost this realization in their mind as they blanked out that they couldn't argue with me anymore, that there was nothing else they could have said, that there was no progress that they could make, and they said, thanks for sharing, have a good night. And so you kind of pause in a moment like that, right? And you think in your mind, right? You, you were brought to the logical conclusion of your worldview, and you're happy now to just reject Christ altogether and walk off. You don't actually have a reason. You just thank me for sharing, and you oh, what do you mean? What do you mean thank you? I quoted scripture. It wasn't my view. I didn't quote my view. I quoted scripture. You, you have to be held accountable to scripture, right? Like, we have to talk about this. And then they, they left. And so you're stuck here. You, know, you should pray for these people and pray that they repent, but the temptation is in your heart, in a situation like that, you just want to be frustrated. What do you mean, Share, uh, thank you for sharing your views? And the temptation is, get frustrated, you know, what, what, what can I go from here? Like, it's not working, I'm going to drive home, I'm sick of it, people don't want to listen to me, that's it, what's wrong with you people, right? And this frustration is likened to that of Jonah. It's a dismissal of the people of Nineveh, even though God's purposes are to send him to warn them and preach against their evil. But this was, this was Jonah's sin. This was Jonah's sin. This was the way he thought about his neighbor. He didn't want them to know. He didn't want them to care about the God of Israel. Right? This was his sin, which as we read across the, the span of the four chapters in the coming, coming weeks, he never really makes a very definitive 180 from. He seems to be fairly consistent with this worldview up until the end, and he never really has any shadow due to change. This is really his mindset throughout this entire book. He remains bitter. He's depressed, he's bitter, he's frustrated, he's disinterested, and even at times he's suicidal. Doing all that he could at every single turn to turn from God's commands, which if we have humility, we can see ourselves in some of those examples. So let's talk about verse 1. We'll read verse 1 again. Who is Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. We're going to understand who he is in the context of where we're talking about. Jonah here, in verse 1, he's called a preacher of the people of Nineveh, called out their evil, and his primary reaction in this text, in verse 3, is to flee, to go away. He says that he's going to Tarshish. And so just so, just so we understand our Old Testament terminology, Tarshish is almost basically symbolic of a very distant place, right? The, it, the, the, the scriptures don't really narrow it down, and geographically, we don't really know where exactly that is. Tarshish is sort of used almost uh, symbolically of a very far and distant location. Some scholars agree that it's somewhere far west of the Mediterranean, towards the Iberian Peninsula, up until where you get pretty much to the Atlantic Ocean, and they almost use it as a symbol symbolism for that reality. That's how far away it is. It's just out of there. And so Jonah is told, go to Nineveh. And what does he do? Geographically, or at the very least symbolically, he goes to as far away as he can get from Nineveh. Nineveh is north of Israel. This guy goes around Italy and out to Portugal, out to the Atlantic Ocean. This is his mindset. It isn't, uh, it isn't a good mindset. Jonah's mindset is, Nineveh, I'm going to the Atlantic, right? And over the course of the four chapters, you'll get many different glimpses into his mindset and why he thinks that way. And we'll get into some of those today. Here he's named Jonah, son of Amittai. We don't necessarily know who Amittai is. There's not really anywhere else in Scripture that talks about Amittai. It does say, though, in 2 Kings chapter 14, that Jonah is from a town in the northern kingdom called Gaphepha. This is about a thousand kilometers journey to Nineveh. And this is where he is. We know that Jonah, up until this point, has already been used by God in order to prophesy for King Jeroboam II. And so he's already had an experience where he's had to declare to somebody else the truth of God and be a prophet. And so up until this point, he's already experienced some of that. And so in line, uh, he, he, uh, in line with this, he does prophesy to Jeroboam II that this northern part of Israel was going to, going to undergo much flourishing, and that the borders around it will be established. You can read that in 2 Kings chapter 14. And so in line with this prophecy, it happened. The northern kingdom of Israel at the time was starting to boom. It was starting to boom and it was starting to become a very uh, 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 profitable empire. And so King Jeroboam, uh, though he was in deep sin and rejection of the commandments of Yahweh, he didn't repent 
Though the prophets of Amos and Hosea told him to, which we will read, he still underwent some kind of flourishing in his kingdom. And so God showed his patience through that. Amos said concerning the northern kingdom to Jero uh, Jeroboam, that, uh, in, in Amos 9 verse 10, that all sinners of my people shall die by the sword, says God, who say disaster shall not overtake or meet us. And so whereas Jonah's prophesied that before this would happen, this area would flourish, later on it was said that this area would crumble. This was the, the climate at the time. And so, consequently, historically, both were true. For a time, that northern kingdom was flourishing, it was doing really well. Uh, Jonah's prophecy, of course, came true because it was from the Lord. And consequently to that, Amos' prophecy came true after that moment because it did fall. This shows both the patience of God and the mercy of God, as well as his justice and his holiness to not let sin go unpunished. Over the course of many years, God was patient with Israel, blessing them with prosperity. However, during this time, King Jeroboam was living in abject rejection to the God of Israel. He was instituting animal sacrifices to pagan gods. He was worshipping idols through them. He was turning places of worship to Yahweh into places of worship unto Gentile deities. And this was mainly due to the separation of the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel. While the southern kingdom enjoyed temple sacrifices in Jerusalem, the northern resulted to pagan religion, pagan ideologies, pagan worship, of which Jeroboam, himself the king, participated in. During the time of Jonah, however, during this entire process, God had not yet poured out his wrath upon the northern regions of Israel. Of course, this all came to an end, eventually, when Assyria exiled uh, under, the, under, the, under the persecution of, of uh, Assyria. Uh, the northern parts of Israel were exiled to Assyria and thus destroyed in their parts. This happened about a hundred years after, but for the time being, this northern area of Israel was flourishing. Gath Hefer included the place where Jonah was from and the entire region of the land of Zebulun, where all of this was happening. Everything was going great for Jonah. Everything was going great for the northern parts of Israel at this time. And then God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. So even as we formulate context up until this point, we get a glimpse into why Jonah thinks the way he does already about Nineveh and why he has so much uh, wanting to get away from God already. He's living in a peaceful time. Life is pretty good. Things are going pretty well. The northern kingdom is sort of flourishing. Life is pretty good here in Gath Hefa. It's like a little uh, bar and bay location, right? It's a nice little holiday spot for me. Life is good. Leave me alone, God. This is his mindset. This is the way he's thinking so far. Life is good, right? My job is done. I prophesied to the king. Remember, that was pretty big, right? I went up to the king, prophesied to him. I said a lot of nice things that his land was going to prosper and things were going to go really well. But I still prophesied for the king. You know, Amos and Hosea, they looked after the much more harder prophecies, which meant that they got persecuted because they said things like Israel's about to be destroyed. But, you know, my job is over. Life is sweet. And the first barrier for his wanting to reject God and wanting to reject his commands is already evident even in and through that. It's evident in his residing in this very peaceful, flourishing northern kingdom under the rule of a sinful king. And then the Lord stops him in his tracks. The Lord stops him in his tracks. The Lord said to Jonah, I already have one obstacle right off the bat, one obstacle in the way of missions for Jonah, and it's the ease of life. It's the fact that life is pretty good. Life is pretty easy right now. Why would I want to ruin that? You have this overwhelming desire, and all of us have it. All of us have this indwelling temptation, even now. New covenant believers in the modern day called to missions by the Lord Jesus himself. Go therefore, make disciples of the nations. We did the kingdom series. We've already talked about it, right? And we still embody this. Again, it is the universality of sin that we are focusing on in this series. Then we look at the second excuse. We look at maybe another reason why Jonah would have such a reaction to the commands given to him by Yahweh. We get that by asking the question, what is Nineveh? Or where is Nineveh? Or what is the, you know, what's the big deal about Nineveh? Or better yet, according to verse 2, what is the evil that Jonah has to call against? Let's read verse 2. 
Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So to understand really the weight of what it means to do that, we need to understand what is it about Nineveh that makes it so evil. Right? What is it? To do that, we need to talk about Assyria. We need to look at what is the, the kingdom of Assyria at the time. At the time, the kingdom of Assyria was the leading, the most perverse empire that the world had ever seen, while at the time being the greatest superpower that the world had ever seen. This is the kingdom of Assyria, right? This is the sort of pound for, pound for pound, top of the list, right? John Jones, Alex Pereira, right? Like the, the scariest dude. Like, you don't want to mess with him. If you don't get that reference, I'll break you, especially if you're a dude. I need to watch more MMA, okay? But this is the scariest city. This is the scariest place, right? Much like to a very dangerous, very scary, very Brazilian UFC fighter that you don't want to mess with. This is this kingdom. You don't want to mess with them don't want to mess with them. This is on so many levels outside of the comfort zone for anyone who is in their right mind logically to make a decision to go to Nineveh. So the Assyrians, as we actually explore why they are so scary, they were known for what was called their brutal psychological warfare. Brutal psychological warfare. They would embody military tactics in their uh, uh, pursuits to take over cities and pillage towns, they would embody military tactics that weren't even necessarily very logical or efficient, but were the most brutish, most barbaric, and most outwardly humiliating for their victims. This was the Assyrians. They were truly ungodly people. They would be intentionally frightening for no reason. Like, it would, it, they would actually go out of their way, use resources, and use time and energy in order to be more frightening. This is the way they were. Right? They, would, they were so perverse that in and through this, they instilled a very deep fear into all of their enemies. They would literally go out of their way for their enemies to feel fear. Wherever they would go, wherever they would uh, pillage, they would instill this fear that everyone else would know who they are. They literally, uh, uh, historically, invented what was uh, earlier not known as the crucifixion, but what later became the crucifixion. But it was a method of torture and execution where they would literally hang people on a sharp skewer, uh, skewer stick and let them hang and rot there so that other people walking by would understand that the Assyrians were here. People would pass by and look at these public ex ex executions that they would leave behind and they would think to themselves not to mess with the Assyrians. As part of their military conquest, they would pillage a town, they would rape the women, they would kill the children, and at times they would find entertainment in toying with their victims as they allowed them to die slowly in a manner of different methods. As they would, uh, after they would uh, do that, they would uh, take away what was the, the, the strongest of men, right? They deemed the weaklings unworthy to do this, but of the strongest men that they could gather, they would force them onto a fish hook in and through their jaw, and they would force them, wherever they were, whatever the travels would be, wherever distance they were from Assyria, they would force these individuals to travel to Assyria by foot, on the fish hook, through their jaw and through their mouth, bleeding out, and in a line order, all the way back to their kingdom. This is the way they were. This is what they did. If your legs gave way in the journey, you would be dragged across the mud by this fish hook. So the strongest who made it, which wouldn't have been many, most of them would have died in these week-long trips in order to get back to Assyria, the ones that actually made it were castrated and forced to work as slaves for the rest of their lives, which probably wouldn't have been long due to all the infections they would have gotten by getting fish hooked and possibly bleeding out. This is what they were. Suddenly, Byron Bay's looking pretty good, right? Byron Bay's looking pretty good. In light of what we were just describing about this city, it's looking pretty good. This fishhook uh, uh, analogy, this uh, illustration that they used to do, this happened to Jonah's town about 100 years after this all took place. This was a fearsome people 
in and through these methods and military advancements, their kingdom grew and it became one of the most, or the most prominent superpower the world had ever known. The Assyrians were a force to be reckoned with. And where does Jonah get commissioned to warn of evil? He goes to Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. This is where he gets sent to. God says, Call out against it, for their evil has come upon me. What was their evil? I think we have covered a massive portion of their evil. But other than that, and in addition to that, was their practices unto pagan gods and pagan deities. They were wildly uh, uh, monotheistic. They believed in a plethora uh, of gods to which they worshipped and did uh, animal and even human sacrifices to. They believed mainly in a single pagan god who was sort of the chief leader of them all called Asher, which is basically what Assyria was named after, right? Asher, Assyria. Asher essentially was a war god and a war god of military and conquests. And so hence why they lived the way they did. That's something to remind ourselves even today as we think about uh, why that connection makes so much sense. Well, the reality is you live in step with the worldview that you proclaim. Right? Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, you're either uh, amazingly inconsistent and submit to a lot of Christian principles, or you're very consistent and you become a jihadist, or you become an Assyrian who does this sort of stuff, or whatever it may be. Whatever your worldview is, you eventually start to apply it. And Assyria itself was named after this false god who was the god of conquest and the sort of military-like evil, and so to be devout to him was to perform these kind of practices. So another one of Jonah's obstacles is very clear to us. Fear. He was terrified. Right? How could you not be? Right? There, was, there was the impending uh, bias and preference to stay in the walls of God's covenant-blessed Israel where it was safe and he had the ease of life. There was the excuse of the ease of flourishing in the land under King Jeroboam. There was no doubt personal vendettas against neighboring cities and neighboring nations and against obviously the evil of Assyria not wanting to have anything to do with them there would have obviously been nationalistic sort of pharisaic uh, uh, sort of Jewish pre prejudice which would later embody in the modern day uh, Pharisees that Jesus would have had to encounter and the list goes on and on this one would have been also fear but I think as we sort of take a step back and we look at all of these examples, and we look at all of these ways that you can come up with all of these different excuses, there is one reason why Jonah did this, and there is a reason also why we embody this similar thing, and it's sin. This is the main reason. This is the universal reason. This is sort of the overarching reason that makes all of those reasons very subordinate and second to it. It's sin. Personal sin. This is a reason that towers above the rest, and it is a universal one that everyone embodies. Sin. Sin, as described by theologians, is the lack of conformity to the law of God. By way of special revelation by God, in and through his scriptures, you read it, or in Jonah's case, you hear it, and you say, I'm not doing that, that's sin. When God says to do something and not to do another, we must obey. If not, we sin. It's a fairly bare bones basic understanding of what sin is. And again, it's a universal experience. Wherever we find ourselves, right, the best of people, the worst of people, it doesn't matter because those categories don't even really exist. Wherever we find ourselves, we are sinners. Whatever excuse we could muster, whatever secondary reasons we can bring to the table, or even share with others so that we can seek to kind of quiet down our conscience, it doesn't matter. We are sinners. And the overwhelming application as we read the opening to this book is this. Repent and believe that Jesus died for you. And even though you embody that of, an, of, a, of a sinner, Right? An unbelievable lack of conformity to the law of God and are a sinner, even though that God should crush you, God should punish you, and even though that's true, you can repent and believe in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and thus live like that reality and, and seek to put your sin to death in light of it. You can seek to crush your sin and live for God and live for his mission and not flee to Tarshish out of fear, out of persecution, out of ease of life or pride, and especially out of sin. Jesus has functionally done something for us. 
Right? He, has, he has done something to rid us of the condemnation that we deserve since we are sinners. Outside of Christ, you fundamentally live your life where you continually seek to flee from the presence of the Lord. You always want ease of life. You always want to sin. You always want to flee from the presence of the Lord. You always want safety. You never want fear. You want the best for you because that's the way you're wired. This is the way we think outside of Christ. Outside of Christ, you fundamentally live your life in such a way where you also, as a result of that reality, seek to get as far away as possible to the God that calls you to repent. Romans 1 touches on this. It says that you live in such a way where God is right there, through a thin veil, able to be seen, able to be grasped, right in front of you, right? You've heard the gospel, you know he's real, you look around and can only make the logical conclusion that a God of intelligence and a God of logic has put this all together. You have no other option other than submitting to absurdity. You know all of these realities according to Romans 1, and if you have heard the gospel, you know how to be saved by him, but it says that your fundamental problem is not that he's not there. Your fundamental problem is not that you think he's not there, or you think you don't believe in him, or you think there's not enough evidence, or if he just showed himself, then you would believe. None of that. Your fundamental problem is that you were a sinner. Your fundamental problem is that you have love for your personal sin, your ease of life, your freedom to murder, your freedom to cheat, your freedom to commit adultery, and you suppress the knowledge of him in your unrighteousness, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1. And so believer, you need to, unbeliever, you need to know this. That is a futile endeavor. The, the, the question is not, is Jesus Lord? The question is, are you going to submit to him as Lord now? Or are you going to recognize that when it's too late? The reality is that he is Lord. Jesus is willing. Jesus is sufficient. His sacrifice on the cross for sinners is sufficient to save you from your current state where you can live your life, therefore, as a saved person, but yet a crooked instrument for the sovereign plan of God that he can work through you and save many more souls, all according to his glory. Just as Jonah, with all his infirmities, with all his failures, but used by God sovereignly. Jesus would have had you in mind as he died a substitutionary death on the cross in your place that you can, re you can be redeemed from your sinful life. You can be changed from those works that displease God. And you can live a life unto the Lord who has saved you in gratitude for what he has done for you. You may receive the righteousness of Christ solely on the basis of the faith that you have in him. Do not walk away today unless you have done that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace. As we pray to you, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for examples like Jonah of a simple and crooked man who was used for your purposes. And Lord, in and through that, will we be encouraged as your people to live lives that are pleasing to you, God. To not fall in the, in the, in the, in the errors and the sins of Jonah, but rather, Lord, let us be faithful to your calling, faithful to your word, and live as ones uprightly unto the plan that you have for us in this life, to walk in works that were prepared according to your grace and according to your wondrous will. Would we please you, Lord, with our lives? Would we sacrifice for you in all that we do? And Lord, would you be pleased with our work and be glorified? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.